Hey guys, welcome to the Nick Buy YouTube page. You know what you need to do. You need to subscribe, you need to ring the bell, you need to like the page, you need to leave a comment. I appreciate you. All right, so let's get into some of my thoughts on what I see from uh, year three of, of Fred Hoiberg's tenure at Nebraska. And if you pause and reflect for a second, you think about the first two seasons for Coach Hoiberg in Lincoln. Obviously, it haven't haven't gone how anybody hoped or or, or wanted them to go from a win loss standpoint. Um, but you know, to be fair, I will say, and this isn't to necessarily line up and 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 you know, cry a river for Fred Hoiberg. They, they've been dealt some difficult circumstances, and in some ways, year one they had a complete roster flip. The only returner they had really was Thor, Thorir Thorben Yarnison, who is just kind of a role guy. And whenever you're completely flipping the roster like that, it can be a tricky thing. I mean, there, there can be times where you can hit and find the right combination of guys that fit and and the talents there. And then there are times it's just you can come up empty. And I've, I said it back then. I'll say it again. To me, the talent level just wasn't quite there for that group in year one. And there's a non-negotiable level of talent that you must possess if you want to have success in the Big Ten. And to me, that group just didn't, have enough of it. And then you look at, okay, so that's year one. You look at year two. And it's, first of all, it's another pseudo roster flip again. And then the pandemic hits, COVID hits, which greatly impacts Fred Hoiberg's ability to install his system, to get off-season workouts, to to go through individual workout sessions, all those sorts of things, which, which makes a difference. Basketball is a chemistry sport, and the only way to acquire that chemistry is to get on the floor and play basketball together, and that group just wasn't afforded that luxury, and I think it really hurt them. And then you, you add to the fact that in the middle of the season last year, they get hit with COVID as bad as any team and it ran through the whole locker room and so it disjointed whatever progress they were making in the season. I get it. You know, there's a lot of people saying, oh, gosh, excuses, excuses. Listen, I see the, I see it more as more so as reasons as to why things have unfolded the way they have more so than than excuses. Uh, but it's, it's a tough scenario to have a brand new team for the most part during a pandemic. You don't get a chance to work on things. And then you get covid that smashes your locker room in the middle of the year. That that's that's challenging. But to me, when you you look at this year, this is the first time since Fred Hoiberg has gotten to Nebraska that he has three things. He's got talent, he's got a little roster continuity, and he's had a legitimate offseason to work and practice with this group. And you better believe all three of those things could be enormously important for this team's success. And they're kind of the reasons why I think Nebraska could be, keyword, could be poised to make a pretty good jump this season. I, I've, when you kind of look at, because sometimes it's not only about you, it's about what's around you as well. I've talked about this on a previous podcast, uh, but the other thing that that I think with Nebraska, that, that could help Nebraska this season is I think the bottom of the Big Ten isn't as strong as it's been in the past handful of years. I really believe that Nebraska's got a window here to move up in the standings because I think the you know team 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, those teams aren't quite as solid. Like you you look around, I think teams like I think Iowa could take a little bit of a step back this year. You lose Luca Garza, you ju lose Joe Wieskamp. Uh I think Wisconsin's a team that loses quite a bit. They could they could take a step back. Minnesota's in a total rebuild. Uh, that they're gonna they're gonna have some difficult times this season. Penn State's in a little bit of a rebuild as well. They have an interim coach, and they now have hired a, a new coach. Uh, that that's a challenging situation. And and you know I look at Northwestern; they got some intriguing pieces that that I think are are capable, but they still aren't they still aren't a great team right now. And I say all that to say that I think Nebraska's got a real shot to maybe leap a lot of those teams in front of them. Which gets you at about, you know, middle of the pack in the Big Ten. Like, I, I really don't think teams like Penn State, Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Northwestern, I don't think those teams are going to be great this year. And if Nebraska finishes ahead of them, you're in the, you know, eighth place in the Big Ten, ninth place in the Big Ten, which to me is definitive progress for Fred Hoiberg and Nebraska, given what has happened the first two years. We'll revisit that in a second. But... Going back to this year's team, 
kind of talking about just the roster and what I see from a broad sense. I've said this for years. If if you want to play fast, Fred Hoiberg wants to play fast, want to take a lot of threes. Great. You you better have two things if you're if you're going to do that. First of all, you better have a point guard that can play with pace and is good in that sort of setting. And you better have shooters. You better have legitimate knockdown three point shooters. I know that feels like a Captain Obvious statement, but it's true. Better have a good point guard that can play fast. And you better have the shooting if you want to spread the floor and take a lot of threes. The reality is, I think for the, the first two years, I don't think they their shooting's been up to par. The numbers kind of back that up. And I don't really feel like they've ever had a legitimate point guard that is good in the open floor, pushing the pace, understanding, playing in ball screens. Then when you get in the half court, all those kinds of things. Cam Mack was a little erratic. Uh, to me, Delano Banton, talented player. He's with the Toronto Raptors right now. I thought he slowed them down. He's more of a methodical, slower paced player. He couldn't really shoot as well. So teams are just going under ball screens and plugging the lane, making things tough for everybody else. Uh, this is the first year to me that I think they have a potential real point guard that can push the pace and play in that sort of system. But to me, their collective Ability to shoot the ball seems like it's dramatically improved. When you look at Lat Mayan, Bryce McGowan's, Kobe Webster, Kise, Kise Tominaga, CJ Wilcher, Bryden Bach, Keon Edwards, even Trey McGowan's was a high 30% three point shooter. Like that, that's a lot of guys. How many are they saying? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I mean, they got eight or nine guys that are like, you probably don't want to leave them open for that shot. You better get a hand up, better run them off the line. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And then when you potentially sprinkle in Alonzo Verge in there running the show, pushing pace, I guess you, you got the two ingredients to make this system pop. And I feel like that's a very positive thing for Nebraska heading into year three with, with Coach Hoiberg here. But let's take a look at this roster, and I'll give you some quick thoughts and, and on, on a handful of the guys that I see in the rotation could play an integral role. First of all, my projected starting five for Nebraska. Alonzo Verge at the point, Trey McGowan's at the two, Bryce McGowan's at the three, Lat Main at the four, Derek Walker at the five. That's my projected starting five. When, when you kind of go through all these guys, Alonzo Verge is an Arizona State transfer talented dude he's played well in nebraska's first two exhibition games and you know he's an interesting guy because when he was at arizona state he was playing off the ball remy martin was the point guard and remy martin was a heavy high volume had the ball in his hands a lot took a lot of shots kind of a guy so verge sometimes was having to play off of that and he wasn't the point guard so when nebraska signed him i thought okay i don't he always seemed like either was wired to score to me and can he run the team does he see it like a pure point guard so far through two games, he really has impressed me, two exhibition games, really has impressed me with his, his floor game and his ability to play in the pick and roll, read the help side defense, push the pace in the open floor. I think Verge, I, I've said this too, uh, he may not be Nebraska's best player, but you you could make a case he's their most important player because you got to have a point guard that can push the pace. And in the half court, you're playing a lot of ball screen offense. Well, you got to have a guy that is – you know, can can read and react different hedges, hard hedge. They're going to black a ball screen. They're going to switch what they're doing on the weak side with with shooters. You got to be able to see all those things. And it, and I've been impressed so far through two games with how he's seen those things. I think if if he can think like that, not necessarily think not necessarily think like a scorer. They need his scoring, but what they need more so than anything is his ability to distribute the rock. If he can think like a point guard. He, he could be poised for a big year, and Nebraska needs him to have that point guard mindset. Trey McGowan's, listen, you know what Trey is. Super athletic, super tough, super strong. I think he's best suited playing off the ball, being just uh, in attack mode, looking to score. I mean, he can play the point. I think he's not a pure point guard. I don't think he's got that skill set. I don't think he necessarily thinks the game like that. That's not a knock on him. I mean, that's just how it is. Uh, you know, I think he's a guy that is that needs Verge's emergence. He needs Verge to play the point so so Trey can play off the ball and just think about getting buckets. Trey, I think, is a guy that's got elite defensive potential because he's an elite athlete. I think he's a, a dude that they need to, to be steady 
And this is a talented dude, man. I mean, he, he's got a lot of game. I'm excited to see what Trey McGowan's can do this year. You look at Bryce McGowan's, everybody's heard about him. You see him on commercials here locally. Uh, and you know, five-star kid. And the, you know, the first thing that that you think about is handling the hype. You know, when you get that fifth star, you're not a four-star, you get that fifth star, there's an element of pressure that comes with that, especially at a place like Nebraska that doesn't get a lot of five-star kids. Basically never. So... The first thing is, is his ability to handle some of the pressure and the hype. The other thing with him is, can he handle the physicality of the Big Ten? The Big Ten's a grown-ass man league. He's got some grown men in this league. He, he's, a, he's a smaller-framed guy. Can he handle the wear and tear and bigger, stronger guys leaning on him? That's going to be interesting to see. You know the talent's there. You don't become a five-star guy, consensus top 25 recruit, if you can't play. This guy can play. Uh but it'll be interesting to, to to see him progress. They need him to be a real player. Like they they need that guy to to live up to the billing. You know, he needs to be consistently a guy that's scoring the basketball. And we'll see what he can do. Uh, I think he he's going to benefit greatly from playing alongside Trey McGowan's and Alonzo Verge. Um, but he can shoot it. He's long. Uh, I think he's a guy that's going to be good in transition. You know, because that's where his strength isn't as important because everything's spread out. But Bry Bryce McGowan's going to be a really important player. Be interesting to see if he can live up to the hype. Um, they need his his scoring consistently. Lat Mayen at that four spot. I mean, you know what he's going to do. He's going to catch and shoot threes. That's what he does. And in a lot of ways, for you know, I talked about you got to have a point guard. You got to have shooting. When when I when I look at the the specific shooting. Getting shooting from a frontline guy, whether it's a stretch five or a pick and pop four, it's vital. Because when you're running a lot of ball screen actions, you're going to get your rim running dive to the basket. That's likely going to be Derek Walker, whoever's at the five, or you're getting lap man on a pick and pop. And if you don't have someone that is a threat setting those ball screens, setting ball screens becomes not all that beneficial for you. You know, if you don't got a guy, uh, you know, Ivan Udrago. He he wasn't a good finisher. You didn't have to worry about him finishing on the roll, right? Like Derek Walker needs to be able to do that. Same thing on the pick and pop, right? Or if if you don't have a guy that is a threat to throw to to pick and pop for threes, you can sell out to bottle up the ball handler, and and the floor doesn't get quite as spread. Latman's ability to shoot the threes really unlocks this team. It's really really important. You see the teams that run the five out stuff. That getting three point shooting from your four spot is huge. Lat needs to make shots. You know he's capable. I think he'll have a good year. Derek Walker. I, mean, I just talked about him at that five spot. Tennessee transfer was suspended the first half of the season last year. I, I thought when at the end of the year last year you saw what he could do. Um, you know he's not an all Big Ten caliber guy, but he's a guy that I like a lot. He's tough. He's skilled. Uh, he can move. He's pretty good rolling to the rim and finishing. He's not necessarily a, a lob guy at the 10, but he can finish uh, around the basket. And, you, you know, they need big things from Derek Walker because if there's if any if nothing else, the Big Ten is a big man league. I mean, when you look at Hunter Dickinson and Kofi Coburn and Trace Jackson Davis and Trevion Williams and EJ Liddell, I mean, they, they are great centers every night in this league. And you better have a dude at that five spot that can hang in there and – Derek Walker gives Nebraska an opportunity to hang in there at that five spot. Really important uh, player for Nebraska defensively, defending and rebounding, and then offensively pick, roll, dive your ass to that rim, see if you can't suck in that help defense. Then you can spray it out for three-point shooters or pick, roll, catch, finish. That's what he's going to do. He's going to run the floor. He's going to set a ball screen. He's going to dive to that rim, and he's going to try to take defenders with him or Verge is going to hit him. And that's pretty much what his role is going to be. We'll see what he can do. When when you look then at at the guys that I see coming off the bench, C.J. Wilters, a Xavier transfer, guy that's drenched in confidence, former top 100 recruit. Uh, he can really, really shoot the ball. And he he believes in his ability to shoot the ball, which is important if you're if you're coming off the bench as a shooter. He's going to come in and look to hunt threes. He shot it well in the exhibition games. See if he can keep that up. Important piece off the bench. Same thing with uh, with Tommy Naga, the Japanese Steph Curry is what they they've called him. He was in the three on three Olympics for Japan. He can shoot it. Now I think the thing with him is he's going to be along that same mold of of Wilcher where he's coming off the bench and he is hunting shots. 
the thing that you've liked about him is he can shoot it off the dribble a little bit. He, he's got range. He can run sets for him. Again, Fred Hoiberg is a, a legitimate big-time shooter, and he's been around legitimate big-time shooters as an executive and a coach at Iowa State, Minnesota Timberwolves, and obviously with Chicago Bulls. And his praise for Tominaga is high. You know, he really thinks this guy's a special shooter. The biggest question for me is, can Tominaga guard? Can he guard anybody? That Because you better believe Big Ten teams, are, they're going to try and pick on him. They're going to ISO him. They're going to drive it right at him and make him defend. To me, I, I, I'm i confident he can score and shoot. He'll be okay on that end of the floor. The other end of the floor, can he hang in there? That's the biggest question for me. Kobe Webster is back, Western Illinois transfer, who played at Nebraska last year. He used He's using that super senior year with – with COVID, and I've always liked Kobe Webster. Steady, solid, space the floor, a dude that can that is that can make an impact, not necessarily taking 10 to 15 shots a game. Uh, he's a dude that I thought should have played a little bit more last year, um, but, but it'll be interesting this year because now he's got other guys off the bench that can do what he does in Wiltshire and Tominaga. But Webster, again, you're talking about a, a super senior. He's played in a lot of basketball games. We'll see what his role looks like. He's a guy that I've always thought is solid, but you know what he can do. He's solid. He can space the floor. Keon Edwards is a DePaul transfer, former top 100 kid. He's got a unique story from the standpoint of he reclassified and enrolled at DePaul last year in December in the middle of the, the, the pandemic and the basketball season and only played in a couple games at DePaul. And then Dave Lado, DePaul coach, gets fired. Now he ends up in Lincoln. So, He's kind of just not even scratched the surface on what he can do. But he's played well and shot it well in the two exhibition games. Again, top 100 recruit, the talent's there. Uh, you know, he, he's a he's a, a, a taller, versatile wing that I think, you know, could could play a, a, a pretty good role for, for this squad because the other guys are, you know, Wilcher, Tominaga, Kobe Edwards, those are smaller guards off the bench. Edwards has a little bit more size. Um, Wilhelm Breidenbach, a a five man from California, another four star recruit. Um, he's your skilled guy. He's got the goggles. He looks like he's straight out of YMCA noon ball. Uh, but he's that five spot that that Fred Hoiberg had success with at Iowa State. Whether it's with uh, with Nyang, with with Royce at Iowa State, like those guys at the five that can pass, can shoot, can do a little bit of everything. That's what Brian Bach is. Now, Brian Bach's not a great athlete. His his foot speed laterally is not great. That's going to get tested, obviously, on the defensive end of the floor. But offensively, he's skilled. So he'll be able to give teams a different look, being that stretch five, and be able to pass a little bit as well. And then the other compliment you have then is Eduardo Andre, the other backup five, in his ability to be a pure five in terms of long athletic rim protector. So you got two, a couple of different looks behind Derek Walker. You want to go skill, space the floor, Breidenbach. You need to do the defend that's got some length and athleticism. You go Edward or Andre. So we'll see what happens with those two guys. Uh, but that, that those are the main dudes that I see in the rotation. And, uh, you know, the, again, the talent the talent level is is officially much, much better. Much better. Better shooting team. A lot of pressure on Verge to run the show, but there's a lot to like about the ingredients that are there for Fred Hoiberg. Whether or not everything can come together remains to be seen. You know, they still got to go out there and do it. And that's what's hard is, hey, what are your expectations for this team? I don't know. I mean, talk to me, talk to me a month into this thing, right? Like we still got to see them go out there and 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 do it. And something that Fred Hoiberg has talked a lot about is this team's ability to handle in-game adversity. That's something they've struggled with the first two years where they're going, they're going, they're going, they get punched in the mouth in a game, they stagger, and they can't really recover. They've had a hard time doing that. We'll see how what that all looks like. The reality is the only way you can acquire that is you got to go through it as a group and come out the other side in a positive way. So we'll see what happens when they get punched in the mouth. But I think this team's got the talent and the skill set to take a step in my opinion, the NIT feels like good progress. I know some people don't, don't want to hear that. Oh, I want to go to the tournament. Listen, I mean, a few things break right. You could, I mean, you could play your way into the bubble. That's the beauty of the Big Ten is you got opportunities each night to, you know, play your way into those conversations. But again, let, let, let this team, you got to go prove it before I'm just going to anoint them. Hey, they're going to be in the NCAA tournament. Let's see what happens. Let, let's see what happens. I, I think, like I said at, at the, tar, at the uh, a, few, a little bit ago, 
when, when you look at the bottom of the Big Ten, I think they got a chance to move up in standings. I think, to me, they finish in that eighth or ninth place, get out of that playing game in the Big Ten tournament. That feels like progress. And then getting to the NIT, to me, feels like like progress. But we'll see. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm excited, man. I'm really excited to see what this group can do. They got a lot of intriguing uh, guys on this roster. And it'll be fun to see what Fred Hoiberg can do with his offensive mind kind of putting guys in the right spot with this group. Should be fun to watch. Those are my thoughts on Fred Hoiberg's Nebraska Cornhuskers heading into year three. Can't wait to uh, to see this group go out there and do their thing. All right, enough of my thoughts. Let's get to the head coach Fred Hoiberg's thoughts on his Nebraska Cornhuskers. Had a few technical difficulties. Wanted to, to do video with Coach Hoiberg, but we had to do it over the phone. It's a really good conversation. Again, no video but you're going to be able to hear the audio of this conversation with Fred Hoiberg. So let's get to it. Year three, Fred Hoiberg, head man, Nebraska. Here's a great conversation I had with him about his team and what he sees this season for his Nebraska Cornhuskers. All right, on the line now is the head basketball coach of your Nebraska Cornhuskers, Fred Hoiberg. And uh, coach, I really appreciate it. I know this time of year is 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 slammed with trying to get everything, uh, everything in before things kick off. First of all, how you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks for having me on, Nick. How, how are you? I'm I'm doing great. I got two I got I got two fun questions to get things started. Uh the first one is have you chewed out Sam yet? Like at, at practice. <laughs> has he has he gotten the dad stare or anything like that? Every day, Nick. That's that's <laughs> my uh yeah. No, he's uh he's been great, Nick. I've I've been really pleased with everything Sam has done for our team. I'm I'm really proud of him for going out there and, you know, playing his role and doing exactly what we need out of him. Uh, he's played really, really well. I've, I've been happy with how he has transitioned and how he's adjusted to this level. And his job this year, most likely as a red shirt, will be to get our guys that are eligible, um, you know, ready to play in these games and have a big role on the scout team as uh, as we start preparing for games here this next coming week. You know, Coach, I, was, I look at basketball now, and then I think about your skill set as a player. Obviously, you had an incredible career, but do you ever think that you maybe came in the wrong era? Like, do you ever think about how effective you would be in this era with with the importance of the three point shot? Uh, pretty much every day, Nick. <laughs> I, I, I have those thoughts. I, you know, it was kind of just starting to transition into the whole world of analytics, which we live in now. Right as my career was ending, uh, you know, with with the heart condition and the heart surgery that I had, that basically uh, forced me into retirement. And, you know, then the shooting just became such a premium. And a lot of that is based on the offenses that you see pretty much across the board now in the NBA with the five out spread offenses and, you know, analytics, the way they are trying to create as many uh, rim shots as possible and, and kick out threes. And that's the, the way teams are playing right now. You know, we ran some five out concepts when I was at Iowa state, I had the kid Royce white yep. who was so gifted as a passer uh, you know, kind of a freight train coming down the floor and, and just put floor spacing and shooting around him. And we actually led the nation in threes that year. Uh, you know, then the NBA kind of went from a four out one in, uh, you know, used to be a three out two in a lot of it when back in the old days, back when I was playing at first, it was a lot of isolation basketball just because of the rules. They had the illegal defense rule where you couldn't cross the midpoint you couldn't go below the free throw line unless you actively were uh were double teaming so really it was two on two basketball and then you'd lift your generally your three and your five man get them out of the way and just let your great players go to work and then you know kind of transition to a three out two in and then a four out one in now you know mike budenholzer i guess was really responsible when he was in atlanta you know kind of ran some of the same concepts with a post al horford a lot of times and then he really kind of created this five out movement motion offense and then you know golden state obviously became elite at it with the skill level and draymond green making plays and all that skill uh you know coming off action so you know the game is, has really changed i guess kind of a long-winded answer to your question as oh, far as shooting right. uh you know but it is you see these contracts now i mean duncan robinson signed a 94 million dollar contract uh you know you see joe harris and the contract that he signed so you know it's it's great it's just kind of the evolution of the game and, and analytics and the math that's involved in it now just puts such a premium on on shooting and, and here's the interesting thing though because all those things are just are 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 beyond true and prevalent at all levels of basketball but when you look at the big 10 everybody tells me the center position the pure five is dying but geez 
coach. Like the Big Ten's loaded every night with all American caliber bigs. It's it's kind of interesting how the Big Ten still has, you know, they they still will run some some five out stuff and take a lot of threes, but it's a unique league in that regard where they still have bruising five men, whether it's Kofi Coburn, Hunter Dickinson, whoever that they can kind of pound the ball into. Is that maybe the most the biggest thing you've learned so far through two years in the Big Ten? Yeah, no doubt about it. The, the Big Ten, you know, certainly it's not a dying breed in our league. <clears throat> you right. know, you can throw uh, EJ Liddell in there, and then um, you know Kyle Young obviously will will go in there and, and bang around. Uh, you know, one of the toughest players in our league. Um, you know, Harar out of Penn State is a big, strong, uh, you know, five man that that's very mobile, great offensive rebounder. So yeah, they are. They're all over the place. Michigan State will always have a guy in there that can post and get you a basket in the paint. Um, you know, it, it, big 12, when I was coaching there, we, we had a lot of that as well. I think one of the reasons we had a lot of success is we were able to take those big guys away from the basket. Right. And, you know, I'm hopeful with the makeup of our roster this year, we'll have some lineups where we can do that. We can take, you know, when I was at Iowa state, we take Jeff with out of the paint and he was the number one shot blocker in the country. And, you know, in turn, I think Kansas gave up 40 points in the paint three times that year and all three were to us. But when you can spread a team out like that, it's going to create a lot of driving lanes. And then when the defense collapses and helps in, if you have floor spacing, you can really take advantage on the backside. So it is, you know, with us, obviously Garza being one of the great all time college players at the five spot uh, at Iowa last year, and then Dickinson coming in doing what he did as a freshman, um, you know, Kofi at, at Illinois. I mean, there's there's some great bigs in our league. And hopefully with floor spacing this year, that we'll be able to take some of those guys away from the basket. When you look at your team right now, Coach, one of the biggest differences with your group is that you actually had an offseason with workouts and individuals and a, a full allotment of practices. Where do you think having a full off season of workouts and practices and individuals and all that will like? Where do you think that manifests itself and makes the biggest difference on the floor with your team? Well, I think I think a big thing, Nick, is we, we're certainly able to get our uh, our system in both offensively and defensively a lot quicker, and we're able to work a lot more fundamentals. Uh, you know, basically the first summer session when our guys first got together was all the way back in June. And really for about three weeks, all we worked on was fundamentals and skill work. Uh, we did not have that time a year ago with not really having a summer. And then once our guys got there in the fall, uh, it was small group until we started practice. And then obviously have so much to put in from a team perspective. So we just had so much more time this year to get a lot of those fundamental uh, type of activities in early and then really start building the system uh, from the ground up and not having to hurry through, you know, you got to master A before you get to B. Last year, you know, we tried to put probably too much in early. And then after the COVID shutdown, our guys really picked it up and, and figured it out. We played some of our best basketball at the end of the year. So to have some continuity and to have all that time uh, that we had leading into the season, I think was a big advantage for our team. You know, whenever whenever you talk, uh, whenever I've talked to you about your team, you talk about pace, you talk about tempo, you talk about pushing it. Um you know, for me, I always feel like there's a difference between playing fast and taking fast shots. And when I when I watch the two exhibition games you guys have played, I think personally, I think this is by far your best team at Nebraska in terms of pace. You guys are really pushing up the floor. You're getting good shots. Uh, I think Verge has a lot to do with that. How do you see the pace right now for your group? Yeah, I think the pace has been solid. And when we get it up the floor and we make simple plays, I think generally it ends in at least a good high quality, high percentage shot. Uh, you know, when we go down and we rush, I agree with you 100% on, on what you said, Nick. When we rush that thing down there and, and take a, you know, off balance, uh, you know, maybe mid range shot without a pass, that's when we got ourselves in trouble. That's when Colorado certainly went on a big run against us in the second half before that it was beautiful basketball we had that thing moving it was not sticking in guys hands and we shot a great percentage uh, you know leading up to that point I think we uh, you know were on pace to score over 100 for a lot of that game until we went on that lull so you know just continuing to do the things that make you successful or that have made you successful early in games and not getting away from that and you know I'm, gl I'm really kind of glad that it happened because we we're able to address it uh, able to watch it and, uh, and hopefully correct some things from that stretch. Talk to me about, about Alonzo Verge a little more because whenever I watched him at Arizona State, I, mean, I think he had 40-some in a game against Boise State. He seemed like he has a scoring mentality, but man, 
it, through two games, I really like how he's kind of run the team as a pure point guard. Is that something that's natural for him? Have you had to talk to him about that? Because that that really, really unlocks a lot of things that you guys do both in the half court and the full court. Well, he really played off the ball in his time at Arizona State. They right. had a great point guard, Remy Martin, who ended up transferring to Kentucky – or sorry, to Kansas. And, you know, for us, it was uh, when we watched him on film – I, I did see the ability to make plays and to uh, uh, to be a very good passer and have a good feel. Uh, but really, his role on that Arizona State team was to score the basketball in more of a shooting guard uh, type role. So, you know, I've, I've been really pleased with Alonzo. We felt very fortunate to get him when he, when we did, especially with Delano Banton yeah. uh, staying in the draft. So he's he's been, uh, you know, a very important part of what we're trying to do because of his pace, because of his ability to get the ball at the floor. And really, his feel. That's what I've been most impressed with. Talk to me about Bryce McGowan's because you know it's one thing to watch him on film. It's one thing to to maybe watch him play in AAU. It's another thing when you get him day in and day out in practice. Certainly, the talent is there. What is what has stood out to you having him on a daily basis? I think the biggest thing is his poise, especially for a young player. He he had obviously has had a lot of. Uh, you know, things said about him just because of the type of player that he was his entire high school career. And, you know, to be able to come in and have the poise and the patience that he has has, has been remarkable. And, you know, it's tough. It's an adjustment for, I don't care, you know, the hype on you, how many stars you have, whatever it is, it's an adjustment uh, to come to this level. And, you know, he comes into work every day. He's always coming in for an extra workout. He loves coming in for individual film sessions. And you can just progressively see him getting more comfortable and getting better. And I thought from the first game to the second, he made a huge step yeah. in the right direction against a power five team, led us in scoring uh, with 15 points at the big three uh, late, really to kind of seal the deal and put the game away. And uh, yeah, just everything about him, I, I think from a poise standpoint, he's such a good kid. Uh, you know, a lot of times you don't have that when you have a guy like that that comes in. Uh, you know, with, with that type of resume. And, you know, he's just been so humble throughout this all. The guys have really liked him as a teammate. What about Trey, big brother? What, what's what's kind of the next step for Trey McGowan's? What have you harped on with him? Yeah, you know, just to continue to keep things simple. And when he goes out there and makes the right play, he had a great practice uh, earlier today. With He had five assists, zero turnovers. And when he makes simple plays with his speed and ability to get into the paint, you know, that's going to create really good opportunity for other guys. And then just continue to be to take pride in that defensive stopper role. I thought early in the Colorado game, he really was the key for us, getting deflections, getting his hands on balls, creating turnovers. And then that got us out in transition, and that got us confident. Right. And when you got a guy like that that takes pride in that role, uh, you know, it makes things easier. He only took a couple shots, you know, in the first two games, but had as big an impact as anybody on that game because of his defensive intensity. I want to talk a little bit about a handful of these newcomers. Let, let's start with Tommy Naga. I mean, he he's a guy. Not all shooters are created equal in terms of how they get shots. Some guys they have to have their feet set. Some guys uh, can shoot it off the bounce. Uh, it, some guys got range. Some guys don't. He seems like he checks a lot of those boxes. He can make a variety of threes, uh, whether it's off the bounce, off the catch. Is that kind of is is that accurate? What 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 do you see as a shooter with him? Yeah, you know, the, just his mentality. He, he's he's got so much confidence in this ability to knock down shots, and that's half the battle as a shooter is to have the confidence that you're going to go out there and and knock them down, even if you miss one. To have the mentality to continue uh, to shoot. He certainly has that. Uh, you know, interesting stat from last year when when he shot the ball from over 25 feet, he shot over 43 percent. Uh, you know, from those shots. So he's got incredible range, yeah. uh, you know, hit a big one from about 27 feet in transition after CJ Wilcher had just knocked down a couple and he just, uh, he's got that uh, ultimate confidence. So, you know, he, he can shoot it coming off screens. He can shoot it off the dribble. He's just one of those guys, uh, you know, that we want to find, you know, in transition, right. we have to do a good job of finding him wherever he is on the floor just because of his ability to knock down shots. So I'd imagine, you know, because the one thing I wrote down with Wilcher is confidence. Like, I, I I had him a couple of times at Xavier last year, and, man, when he came in, it didn't matter if he had been sitting for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. If he got a good look, he was letting it rip. He seems like he's drenched in confidence, too. Yeah, no doubt about it. He, you know, he ripped off three in a row when he got in the game the other night yep. and, uh, you know, had a great look in the second half as well. He just, he, he, you're absolutely right, Nick. He, he raises up with, uh, you know, a great confidence on his shot as well. Another kid that's always in the gym, you know, both those guys we talked about so far with he and Kese, uh, 
you know, they, they're great shooters because they work at it. And, you know, that's, that's what I've always found. If, if you've got guys that spend time getting the gym, work on their craft, uh, that's going to translate. And certainly those two guys do that. You know, what's good about with Breidenbach and Eduardo Andre, you got different looks at the five to kind of back up Derek. If you want to stretch a guy out, Breidenbach knocked down a couple of threes the other night. Andre's more of your traditional kind of rim protector, long athletic five. It's got to be nice to have options when you go to the bench at the front court. Yeah, uh, for sure. And, you know, Wilhelm, you know, picked up two quick fouls in the first half, didn't play much, and then came in in the second. Uh, you know, I think when he knocked down those two, that put us up 27 with about 12 minutes to go in that game. And uh, it was great to see him continue to shoot. Then he had another one where he stepped out on an inbounds play, uh, you know, shot it right in the guy's face. It was just a little bit short, but he, he has a very unique player. And, you know, not only his ability to shoot, but his ability to pass. Uh, you know, that's what we saw when we started recruiting him early in the process and how well he would fit in our five out spread offense because of his passing ability. So been really, really impressed with him. And again, another kid that's got great poise and plays uh, beyond his years. Uh, you know, as far as Eduardo, I, I really uh, was happy how he progressed as a player, started out the season out of our rotation, uh, worked his way into it and finished off the year, uh, you know, finishing a lot of games for us. He's put on some size and weight and uh, absolutely he does give us another dimension because of his ability to protect the rim with his length and, and, and roll to the rim. He's finishing much better this year. With Keon Edwards, he feels like a guy that's just scratching the surface, kind of some, some tough circumstances for him last year. He reclassified, uh, he enrolls at DePaul in December. So he's still kind of learning and, and growing, but I really, have, I thought he's, he's played well for you guys in the, in the two exhibitions so far. Yeah, he, he shot the ball well, made all three of his threes in the first game, uh, you know, hit one Colorado through his zone out there. We had a really good possession, hit a three in the left corner. Uh, you know, the thing I really like about Keon, his size is probably our best offensive rebounder and his ability to defend. We're going to need, uh, you know, that size and length on the wing to defend, you know, a lot of the great players uh, in our non-conference schedule and also in our league. So Keon gives you that because of his athleticism and, uh, and obviously he's got great size. A few more things are out of here, Coach. Appreciate your time. What what are you – two-part question here. What are you most confident in with your team, and what what's your biggest concern when you kind of project the year for your for your, for your your team? Well, I, th I think the biggest area of improvement is uh, is with their shooting. And, um, you know, when you've got guys that can space the floor and you've got a guy like Alonzo Verse that can get into the paint and make plays, uh, that gives you a lot of options. And, you know, that's the thing that I've been really pleased with is, is when we share the ball and make the right play, uh, we get a lot of high-quality looks. So, you know, I'd say that is probably our biggest area of improvement, what I'm excited about with this group. Um, you know, and then in turn, like I talked about, we have to continue to make the simple play. We've gotten much better as the preseason has gone on as far as taking care of the basketball. And then the biggest issue that we have to continue to um, uh, do well is finishing possessions uh, on the glass. Yeah. We gave up 23 offensive rebounds to Colorado. Uh, we gave up double digits in the first exhibition against Peru State. And that's always going to be a concern. If we can finish possessions, get the ball out, get out in transition, I think we've got a chance to have a great year. How's it been for you as a leader so far where obviously, you know, the the end results of, of stacking up wins maybe hasn't hasn't been there, but for you to kind of maintain confidence and balance that pat on the back that some guys need with the kick in the butt that sometimes the group needs. Well, you know, I listen, I, I, I think everybody understood what, you know, where we took over with, you know, Thor being the only guy returning right. uh, that first year. So, you know, we've had a lot of patience from our fan base. We certainly have appreciated that. But I think everybody understands uh, the rebuild and where we took over. And that takes time. You can't turn it over, you know, as, as quickly as everybody wants and in the impatient world that we live in. But based on uh, everything with where we are, I feel great about our roster. I feel great about our future. Uh, I think we've got a chance this year with uh, with what we've put together, and then hopefully we'll have sustained success, uh, you know, and be a team that uh, that ultimately competes for championships. So I'm I'm really excited about where we are, and uh, you know, hopefully we can continue to trend in the right direction. Yeah, and you know, with Pinnacle Bank Arena now having fans in it, not only is it good to just have people back in the stands, it's going to make a difference too on the on the floor, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, you look at our league last year with COVID, no fans. I mean, so there's some teams that had 25 or 26 guys in their roster and basically brought uh, brought them in as, as cheerleaders. 
And, you know, the team that brought the energy uh, over on the bench, especially when teams went on runs, that was very important. Yeah. But now that we get fans back in the building, uh, it's going to be awesome. And, you know, we feel we've got as good a home court as anybody in the country. Uh, you know, our league le- leads the league in attendance, I think, for 45 or 46 years in a row now. So, yeah, it's going to create a lot of excitement. And uh, we're certainly uh, happy to have our fans back in attendance. Well, tell me, though, a, sh- a shooting contest breaks out throughout the whole team and you're involved. You're still winning it, right? Like, you're still out shooting CJ and all those dudes, right? You're still winning. Uh, I don't know. I, you know, <laughs> I, I've said this now. Kase is uh, he's as good as I as I've been around, and you know, certainly, but throw CJ in in that category as well. So, yeah, I had a guy at Iowa State named Tyrus McGee. He was, I yeah. think, far and away the best shooter I had. He was a forty seven percent three point shooter, led the nation as a volume shooter. And you know, I put I certainly put these two guys in that category. That's good to see. Well, Coach, I've I've loved what I've seen through the first two exhibition games. I cannot wait to watch you guys this year really appreciate your time best of luck and i'll be seeing you uh soon as i got you guys a couple of times on tv